Hello and welcome all to One Young World uh, 2022 and to this uh, session on vaccine distribution, new waves, new variants, and old inequity. My name is Isaac Bencomo and I'm a One Young World ambassador for Mexico and currently a master's candidate in global health policy at the London School of Economics and Political Science and I will be moderating this session. Uh, I am a nurse by background and have worked in uh, various uh, humanitarian settings. Uh, last of which was in uh, New York with the International Rescue Committee, managing their infection prevention and control measures in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm very thrilled to be joined today by Paula Puya Hutchinson, the Global Policy Director, COVID-19 Vaccine at AstraZeneca, and One Young World Ambassador, Dr. Vibin Joseph, Executive Director, at a Biozine. So welcome to you both. I'm very, very thrilled to, to have you here. Welcome, Paula. Welcome, Vibin. And well, without any further ado, perhaps we can um, maybe do a little bit of, a, of an, a quick introduction, Paula, if, if, if you might, we can start with you uh, and then we can uh, hear a short introduction by you, Dr. Vibin. Thank you very much, Isaac, and thank you for, for having me. Um, great to be here with, with you today. So I'm Paula Pohya Hutchison. Um, I'm a global policy director at AstraZeneca. And really my background is in, in health policy um, and public affairs, communications. Started my career in, in European Parliament in, in Brussels, and now have found my, my way to, to the UK. Um, for the past five years, I've been working at AstraZeneca, and, and the past two have really been closely involved in our partnership with the Oxford University to develop our COVID-19 vaccine, and then as well with COVAX, um, looking at how our vaccine can be reaching low and middle income countries. So delighted to be here and looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Paula. Dr. Ribbon. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So my name is Ribbon Joseph, and I'm the CEO and the ED at Biozine. Uh, Biozine is literally a baby for us. And what we do is we enable companies manufacture vaccines and AstraZeneca is one of those vaccines which are kind of produced in our equipments and systems. And, uh, uh, you know, like this, we're kind of working in seven countries across the world and about nine different vaccines are actually produced for COVID-19, uh, you know, from a biozine perspective. So delighted and thank you. Thank you once again. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Ribbon. Well, I, I think we can we can go ahead and, and, and get started with the question. And, and, and mostly, of course, both of, both of uh, your work, your path, been incredibly relevant maybe leading up to, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think obviously at this point before uh, this pandemic, perhaps us in, in, in the developed world didn't really consider the importance of vaccine preventable diseases. And I think at this point we have more than 1.5 million people worldwide um, who unfortunately succumb to vaccine preventable disease every year. So what role does really, does global immunization play in interrupting the transmission of infectious diseases and, and preventing further, further uh, deaths? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think actually, after clean water, we know vaccination is the most effective public health intervention there is. And you think about diseases that, that my great, you know, my grandparents or probably your great grandparents Sort of we're very fearful of actually because of vaccinations um you know those are very rare uh, these days so we can think about diseases like polio um that was a real threat 50 years ago but now because of mass vaccination programs that's that's no longer the case um but i think it goes beyond saving lives and improving health i actually think vaccines play a very important role in the broader development of countries you know economic development you know you have gains in education and then we think about something like the sustainable development goals um, and actually expanding access to vaccinations is one of the most effective ways to help countries um, to meet those goals. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Riven, any, any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, so it is true that 1.5 million you know, children actually die every single year. But then again, if we do look at what's happened in the past, I think about 36 million children have actually been saved. Uh, you know, who are actually below the age of five, and that's from 2000. And it is projections are correct that the same level of vaccinations continue. You will have about 29 million more children who will actually be saved because of the use of vaccines. And uh, I also do want to highlight that, you know, say 20 years ago, I think the issue was more about supply and production of vaccines. But I think now what's actually happened is that vaccines, supply is abundant, if I may use that word. 
uh, at this particular stage and at, you know, at, at this moment in time. But then again, what is more important is to ensure that everyone gets the jab. And that would mean a lot of people have to be educated and knowledge dissemination has to happen a lot more, I would say. Absolutely. And, and I think and it kind of moves us into, into my next question. And as in, yes, we, we know we have um, vaccines, we have uh, a supply, right? But, but rather, I think it's been, at least in the, in the offset of the pandemic, it was, it was quite difficult to, to distribute these vaccines. And, and actually, by the end of 2021, just over 5% of people in, in low and middle income countries were fully vaccinated against COVID-19 compared to almost 72% uh, of those in high income states. And I'm sure that these numbers are, are, are much, much higher now. Um, but, but, but I think my question is really, you mentioned distribution, you mentioned that there is supply, but really what key actions do you think need to be taken by the international uh, community to really ensure the equal and global distribution of, of not only COVID vaccines, but, but, but really just vaccines in, in general? Perhaps, uh, uh, Dr. Ribbon, if you, if you could give us your thoughts on that. When you have countries, a few countries manufacturing the vaccines themselves, Typically, what happens is, you know, they would look at themselves at first, you know, before being the good Samaritan. And uh, so I would say the most phenomenal thing that people have to do, the global committee has to do, is, is ensure that manufacturing becomes a lot more dispersed and a lot more countries have the abilities to actually do that. That's the first thing, you know, from a manufacturing perspective. And the second thing would be education, you know, education uh, of the healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, and the public itself because they need to know the importance of vaccines. They actually need to know that vaccine, you know, vaccines are fundamental you know, for a health, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, for, for the healthy uh, life, I would say. Uh, Paula, maybe from, from, uh, from a policy perspective, what, what actions do you think uh, are, are key in ensuring that we, we do have equitable distribution of, of, of vaccines? And what has your role and your experience been on in, in, in that front? So I think one, one critical component is um, making sure governments invest in multilateral initiatives. So, you know, we have the COVAX initiative that was driven by Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, UNICEF, WHO, and really they were set up to support more equitable access. So, you know, for them to be able to procure vaccines, they actually need the funding. And I think that's where it's important that high income countries invest in these initiatives to secure more equal access. Because I think otherwise we'll have always the same issue that, you know, sort of some countries will be at the back of the queue um, if, if these sort of global multilateral initiatives are not prioritized. But then I think we also need sustainable and resilient healthcare systems to be able to administer that, you know, sort of large scale vaccination programs. And that will require everything in terms of actually having people on the ground to deliver the vaccines themselves, um, making sure that, you know, there's the right cold chain capability, the storage facility, actually making sure that we are not just giving vaccines in large urban centers, that we get access in the rural communities, you know, mobile clinics, um, all of these things, together with really local and targeted information campaigns, because we know that, you know, you can't run these kind of campaigns locally. You have to meet the concerns of the local needs and the local communities, and they have to be heavily involved um, in, in local vaccination campaigns for those to be successful. And, and, and Paula, just maybe continuing, you, you, you mentioned COVAX, and, and I am um, fascinated by, by, by this scheme and, and how it really attempted to, to address these gaps. And, and, and I find it uh, well, I, quite um, disappointing, really, how it has been undermined, perhaps, uh, and, 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 and maybe sidelined. But AstraZeneca has sent hundreds and millions of doses of its COVID vaccine to low and middle income countries through, through COVAX and, and, and through the COVAX initiative. So I, I think in addressing the, the issue of, of vaccine equity, um, what, what successes have you seen in, in, in this COVAX initiative? Because I, I, I certainly don't want to make this all doom and gloom because I, certainly there, there are, there are uh, you know, companies like AstraZeneca who have contributed and, and who are trying to address these gaps in, in equity that we see in, 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 in the vaccine distribution. It's, it's a fair question in terms of, you know, how, how well has, has COVAX sort of delivered on its ultimate objective of, of, of equitable access? And now if you look at vaccination rates, actually, you know, in many countries in Latin America, we have very high rates um, in many countries in sort of Asia area. I mean, I think India is a good example with, with, with high vaccine rates. Countries like Vietnam, who first started um, at, on a quite low basis, actually managed to very rapidly then speed up, you know, due to initiatives like, like COVAX. 
but I think it's still fair to say that rates are, are low in the African continent. So, so a lot more that needs to be done. I think one of the things that perhaps, um, you know, if we were to do this again, uh, hopefully we, we don't have to, but unfortunately it's, it's likely that there will be another pandemic. Um, it's really important to ensure that COVAX has got the investment upfront to deliver and to procure vaccines. So actually what happened in, in this pandemic was they were still being set up. They were still raising money um, to be able to procure vaccines whilst you know high income governments had already placed um, orders. So of course that made it challenging for COVAX to sort of compete on, a, on an even playing field. Where we are now is, is I think as Dr. Vivian alluded to, actually we have an abundance of doses. There's a lot of supply and it's turning the vaccines into vaccinations. That's turning, um, that's becoming much more of a challenge. And I think here, it's really looking at what can bodies like like COVAX do. So, you know, you think UNICEF, who is one of the key delivery partners for mm -hmm. COVAX and, and the kind of expertise they have in childhood vaccination programs on the ground, partnering with local NGOs, is kind of making sure that the remit is not just procuring the vaccines and, and sending them off to countries, is actually then supporting the countries um, on the delivery, I think, which which we really need to focus on, which perhaps um, we haven't done enough to date, because the urgency was so much on getting access to the vaccines in the first place. Uh, Dr. Vivin, and perhaps on, on, on that note as well, so what? So my question to you, I think, is, is is what has been Biozine's response to 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 the the need of global uh, COVID vaccines, and and really what solutions do you see aside from technology uh, that are available to to make vaccines more economical, perhaps more affordable and accessible for 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 everybody? Thank you, Isaac. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant question, right? Um, it's just that it's going to make me reminisce all those tough days, literally. <laughs> you know, so it was, it was, it was quite a nightmare. I mean, you know, so beating and, you know, um, priming up to the COVID-19 vaccine requirement was absolutely a nightmare, you know, if I would have reminisced that we have worked, uh, you know, really hard day in and day out, literally to actually make this happen. So if I were to give you a chronology of what actually happened, you know, um, I think that's going to be good for, uh, you know, from an understanding perspective. So COVID-19 was declared as a pandemic, I think sometime in March, 2020. And then since, uh, you know, right after that, you had the scientific community kind of accelerate to find a lot of vaccine candidates. And uh, by September, October 2020, you had about 100 plus vaccine candidates. And I think that really shows that, you know, scientific community is urged to actually create a vaccine. Now, what we did at Biozine is we realized that all these vaccines actually come to one of these four platforms. So it could either be an inactivated vaccine or it could be a protein-based vaccine or it could be a messenger RNA vaccine, or it could be a vector-based, adenovirus-based platform, typically. And what we did is we kind of got back to our drawing boards. We actually leveraged all the expertise that we've had in the last few years, and we made a global design per se, uh, you know, assimilated all these designs together into a large design template and made it easily switchable. And what we did with that is, you know, we literally cut down the design time requirement. That's the first thing that we did do. Once the design was actually readied and we actually did spend much lesser time from a design perspective, we looked at the manufacturing bed. And from a manufacturing bed, what we did is we, you know, looked at the jigsaw puzzle model. So a lot of standard components is what we did put in stock, keep in stock. And whenever there's a requirement, we'd actually accelerate and then you know, assemble it and then send it to the different customers. But there again, because of that approach, what's actually happened is, you know, you had normal production times of about 11 months to 12 months, you know, and that was actually cut down to about five months. So by the time the vaccine companies had vaccines that had to be scaled up in commercial production, we were actually good to go. So that's the first thing from a greenfield perspective, but also from, um, you know, we also did something called retrofitting. We also repurposed the existing facility. So one of the biggest vaccine manufacturers in the world what we did there is we repurposed their facility from a DPT facility, so diphtheria pertussis and tetanus facility, and you know looked at it from an algorithm perspective, from an automation perspective, applied a couple of retrofitting models, and then there you go. It actually became quite successful. So we did replicate this model across seven countries across the world, and uh, and 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 this became really efficient, really efficient that we can actually scale that up. Um, yeah, so that, that would be my, my, my uh, answer to your first part of the question. I think the second part of your question, you know, what can you do it from a 
non-technological perspective, I would actually say it is education. You know, can you impress upon the people on the ground to actually say it is really important to have vaccines made accessible to all the people? And that will mean, can you reduce the vaccine wastages? You know, and that's from a healthcare worker's perspective. From a production perspective, you know, we have actually been kind of promoting biosine training uh, modules. And what we do there is try and incorporate the best practices in the industry with the objective that can you reduce the reject and increase the yield. And the thought process is that the price per dose of vaccine will reduce further. So education is the key. And, you know, from a vaccine production perspective, but then, you know, as Paula did a view to earlier, I think the most important thing at this stage is also to ensure that people get their jabs, get the vaccinations. And I think distribution is important. Supply chain is also important. And a lot of vaccines do not require ultra cold storage, which is a good thing. But there again, how do you make all these people get vaccinated? So some people have hesitancy, some people have issues and some people have legitimate issues to um, vaccine access so i think if we if we do address that it's going to be brilliant really equitable distribution of vaccines is already a challenge and we and we know that but i think also providing developing nations with vaccines and with the knowledge of of safe practices and also maybe even perhaps supporting in their upscaling in their distribution processes is is essential if we really want to turn these vaccines into jabs uh, in 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 people's arms. So really, what what do you see AstraZeneca's role in, in towards tackling these two these two challenges? The, the bit of, of, of knowledge and education uh, and perhaps even engagement to um, in the process of supporting this this distribution either with technical expertise, uh, et cetera. You know, nobody can do this alone. So so this all has to be done in partnership. And I think sort of public private partnerships, you know, having industry part of it with academic institutions, you know, with governments, with NGOs, um, you know, all of those are absolutely critical um, for, for us to be, be successful. I think one of the things that, that we did very early on was we identified um, over 20 partners to manufacture the vaccine um, with us. So these included, you know, Serum Institute in India, of course, well known for, for you know, one of the largest, well, the largest um, manufacturer of vaccines, but also, for example, with, with Fia Cruz in, in Brazil. And what we did was something called technology transfer. So where we shared the technology to develop the vaccine, you know, we worked very closely with our partners sort of day in, day out, um, sort of go through the, the, the recipe book um, as, as we call it, um, you know, training people, of course, doing it all virtually because it was a pandemic. Normally we would do technology technology transfer in, in person. Um, but what that's allowed is actually these partners, if you look at someone like Fia Cruz in Brazil, in the very beginning, they were able to do part of the vaccine. Now they can manufacture the whole vaccine and they can do other vaccines as well. So it's really, I think, what, what sort of industry um, has a responsibility here is to share the technology, to share the expertise, um, the training and the capability so that we have got these local and regional manufacturing partners who can develop vaccines for, for future pandemics. So I think that's that's one thing that's that's, that's really critical that industry can do. Um, the other thing is to partner closely, you know, with the likes of COVAX and, 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 and sort of these type of initiatives. Um, absolutely. And actually what we've seen with our vaccine um, to date is that, um, you know, about two thirds of it has gone to low and, and low and middle income countries. So I think partnering very early with a diverse partnership network um, I think allows you to, to do that and, and support equitable access. Um, in terms of the your, your question about the information and, and what can be done, I think again here what we've seen is um, the issues tend to be local and we see that when when people have got concerns um, or you know they they want to have a conversation about you know why they should be getting a vaccine, actually what they will trust is sort of local expertise, local knowledge, you know, coming from their local community. So so kind of what what we see as our role is is partnering with with local kind of NGOs on the ground, you know, local healthcare communities who have the expertise, who have the knowledge, and I think they are the best placed um, to disseminate messages um, about the importance of vaccination. And I think we've seen, you know, real progress where um, healthcare workers have the time and the resources to engage with local communities. We do see that then vaccination rates rates go up. I think one of the things um, that, you know, unfortunately, um, we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic is that it's disproportionately impacted women and girls. And in many countries, um, you know, women have been at the forefront 
front of, of leading the response. I think something like 80% of, of, of um, nurses and midwives are women and, and they've often been kind of leading, leading the charge. Um, but it's really important to also look at kind of the broader impact of COVID on, on health issues and, and making sure that they don't exasperate existing health inequalities, gender inequalities. And then I think, you know, I know this kind of goes off, off the topic a little bit, but COVID has also unfortunately then um, interrupted routine immunization campaigns. It means in many countries, there's a huge backlog of, of, of sort of, you know, people looking for health care. So, you know, whilst it's been great and fantastic to see the scientific community and everyone coming together to, to tackle COVID, we also have to take a broader uh, point of view to ensure um, that health out outcomes overall um, won't suffer. And and I, I quickly just um, Paula, I just wanted to um, uh, go go back on the on the topic that you mentioned on exacerbating inequalities um, and uh, exacerbating other disparities. But but more so, I think uh, on the topic of crises. Now, um, unfortunately, earlier this year we we saw a, a tragic uh, conflict erupt in, in, in Ukraine and, and that in and of itself has been, has been a crisis. And I, I, just want, I just want to get your thoughts. I, I mean, from, from, from a policy perspective, from a global health perspective, what is the impact that, that crises like, like the war in Ukraine have on, on, on COVID? I think in a, in a one hand, in the short term, what we've seen is sort of a shift in, in political sort of prioritization. So I think understandably many governments um, have shifted their attention to the, to the immediate crisis. Um, and then I think secondly, what's, what's also followed is, is, is funding. So we've seen that how some of the large funders of global health initiatives, you know, like the US government has actually, um, you know, perhaps deprioritized or you know it's, it's become less um active in in, in some of the the initiatives that that you know desperately needed funding including covax including the who act um accelerator program that's not just about covid 19 vaccines but it's also testing about um treatments you know access to pp and, and and so forth um i think i think what we need to make sure we we do as sort of the, the global health community and i think the young health program plays a critical role here is to to continue to highlight the importance of, of, of this issue. And, and it hasn't gone away, you know, COVID is, is, is still here. It's still impacting many, many communities. So I think continue to be to be active at a, at a local level is, is, is critical. But also I think, you know, we need to look at this a bit more broadly. So, so yes, vaccines are, are absolutely important to keep people healthy, but so are healthy lifestyles, so are, you know, prevention programs, you know, and One Health um, program obviously it plays, plays a key, key role here. So I think looking, having kind of a broader look of the importance of, of healthcare system, sustainability and resilience and how that, you know, if, if, if the fundamentals are there, if the right levels of investment is there, the right level of education, the community engagement, you know, whatever crisis sort of happens, that means that the healthcare systems are resilient enough to be able to handle it and, and you know, can continue to, to, to function. Um, but of course, you know, these sort of big global crises, um, you know, will, will have an impact. And I think my, my worry is that as people, you know, learn to live with COVID, um, they perhaps think it's, you know, that's it, it's, it's done, we can move on. Um, and I think what COVID has exposed is, is some of the fundamental flaws in our healthcare systems, you know, also in high income countries, I think we should be clear on that. So, so I think we, we sort of want to see the political leadership continue to look at how do we improve the healthcare systems and how do we make sure we are ready when, when the next pandemic hits. Absolutely, no. That's incredibly insightful. And maybe, maybe on um, more on uh, as we move towards to to closing remarks, uh, Paula, we can stay with you, and, and and maybe you can tell us how can one young world delegates and and, and global uh, future global health policymakers uh, uh, watching this session, uh, how can they become more engaged with the effort to achieve vaccine equity, healthier and safer and and more prosperous um, lives for for everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, I think absolutely, you know, I think all, all young people have the right to, to good health. And, and, and I think that's, that's absolutely critical. You know, young health program can, can play a crucial role here in terms of raising awareness, in terms of engaging and, and mobilizing um, communities. Um, I think, I think we, we all have a, have a role to play in terms of 
you know, accelerating this, this delivery of more, more sustainable healthcare and using our capabilities to strengthen health systems, you know, whether that's volunteering at a, at a local level, whether that's asking probing questions from our members of parliament and, and politicians, whether that's, you know, what Dr. Weaven was saying, you know, engaging with individuals on these topics, I think we shouldn't shy away from the conversations. They can be tough. Um, and I think there's, you know, you know, we, we know that there's there's a lot of work to be done, but I think the fir first thing is to sort of proactively engage and, 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 and you know, even if it's one person at a time, that, that, will, that will make a difference. And I think what, what we've seen with the COVID uh, response is really when everyone comes together, what can be achieved? I think it is really phenomenal when you think about it, you know, billions of doses of vaccines um, have been delivered uh, against the disease, um, you know, we didn't know anything about. So, 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 so things, things can be done, but it does really require the, the mobilization of the grassroots and, and, and the political leadership. And I think one, one initiative I just wanted to highlight as well from AstraZeneca's perspective is that, that we're driving is something called Girls Belong Here, where we really want to um, particularly address this issue of, of inequality um, and, and kind of the healthcare inequalities that women and, and girls um, face. And, you know, one of the sort of very practical things that we've been doing is um, we've been inviting and welcoming young girls and women um, all over the world into our offices, um, hear from them about their health concerns, addressing those and engaging with them and, and helping them to deliver, you know, develop into, into future leaders. So, so I think we all, all have our, our part to play for sure. So I would say, you know, one, you know, one thing where delegates are privileged because, you know, all of you are better off than a lot of other people around the world. And that means you're all leaders and leaders have a responsibility to make this world a better place. And COVID-19 today is an impediment to that. And so are all those preventable diseases. And as Paula did rightly say, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated issue, right? You've got several arms that have to actually move uh, like a wheel to ensure that a lot of people are saved, a lot of people are blessed, a lot of people have the right opportunities to be successful. So I, you know, I would say as leaders, you should, the first and foremost thing is to try and make all the people around you vaccinated and address the concerns, try and actually kind of create, you know, remove the disinformation that is available, you know, within, you know, across the spectrums of society, try and do that and get the boosters and try and adhere to all this public policy health norms that are actually there in different societies. Because please remember, we're not out of the woods yet. We still have a lot of work to do. And uh, uh, you, you, we're just plain lucky, I would say, that uh, we, we are, we are you know, going okay now. A lot of people say it's becoming, an, you know, it's, it is becoming endemic. And I would say, no, that, that's trash is what I would say, because scientifically you cannot show that a pandemic has actually become endemic as of yet. So I think those knowledge has to be kind of prioritized by all the one in world delegates. And the first thing should be to try and ask to kind of, you know, go across all your social networking connects and try and make sure that all of them have been vaccinated. Try and contribute to the local communities with healthcare workers, et cetera, and impress upon the political leadership to try and say that you might be successful, you might be okay, but if you do not save others around you and all the neighbors around you, I think we're going to be, it's going to be really bad, you know? So everyone has to be saved at the same juncture. You cannot have islands of high performance, you know, uh, healthcare systems, but, but then to actually remove the entire thing for good, COVID-19 for good, all of us have to kind of collaborate and work together. Paul, uh, Dr. Vivian, it's been a, a really a pleasure sharing uh, th th this, th th this uh, conversation with you. It's been incredibly insightful, and I'm really hoping that everybody watching this will, will, will feel the same way. I, and, and really just thank you both for not only for your time here with us uh, today, but, but for all the work that you've been doing to, to respond to this, to this pandemic. Just want to wish you both all the best. And um, this concludes the session on, on vaccine distribution. Thank you so much for that informative and important discussion. And uh, thank you all of those for joining. And on behalf of um, One Young World, we are very, very so, so happy, really, indeed, to have you part of this community. Thanks again, indeed, for your time and all the best. Thank you, everybody.